we'll start there. Two weeks worth of work on my talk, it only took about 15 days. <laughs> First 14 days of it. Okay, let's start out real quick and, and explain the name husband. Has anybody here ever kind of wondered where he got that weird name? That's it's very awkward. He started, uh, he, he was named after his great great grandfather on his mother's side. The gentleman's name was Herman Husband. He was a blacksmith back just when the American Revolution was first starting, making end iron, horseshoe, tin, whatever they made, that they, which was a lot of things that they made. When he got very upset with the British for putting taxes on his whiskey, so he decided he was going to go to war with them, and his way of going to war was to make cannonballs. So he made tons and tons of cannonballs for the American Revolution. And it's kind of funny, because here he is making cannonball, or ordnance, Kimmel specialty, all through his Navy years, from the time he was an ensign to the time he was an admiral. His specialty was ordnance and gunnery. So it kind of, generation after generation, kind of carried along the trick. But, okay, February 1st, 1941, he's uh, appointed as a four-star admiral and he's put in charge of the Pacific Theater. Uh, he's the 54th man in the history of the United States to become a four-star admiral. He was a rear admiral, two stars. There were 47 active admirals above him, but he was down here, and they promoted him over those guys. Cool. And so most of these guys recommended him. So it was not a, a big deal. I mean, they wanted him to do that. They, maybe there's one or two that felt slighted, but I never was able to find them. I have one guy that I think maybe, but I can't prove it. So uh, he was in our, uh, put in as, as uh, commander in chief. Just 11 months later, he's turning over the whole thing to Admiral Nimitz. 11 months later, he's been demoted, he's been removed from his office, he has uh, been, it's been suggested that he should retire, which he did, and that didn't look good on the record either, uh, kind of showed guilt, but he retired, and uh, he became one of the most hated men in the United States by the general public. Now the admirals and officers that were under him knew what was going on and they didn't hate him. And of course his family didn't hate him and most of his men didn't hate him, but the public hated him and it was a lot of brainwashing that caused that. So uh, propaganda and brainwashing. So let's get into it here. He's commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet that was St. Pat. They made him honorary commander in chief of the US forces, which is Satis. I always thought that was a weird name. Here's a man that's in charge of all the ships in the, in the United <coughs> States Navy, and it's called Saint Us. No. So, <laughs> so, anyway, that's what he was, and uh, we want to find out now. We eliminated quite a bit of his early life. We're just going to go right into this thing. Okay, why was the Japanese attack so successful? Okay. In a nutshell. It was because uh, we didn't give him the proper information and we didn't give him the proper equipment. He was dealing with some really old, defective old equipment. He inherited this. When he walked in, there's 10 square miles of Pearl Harbor. This picture was taken in October 1940, so it's pretty recent to the time he was done. Am I blocking you? No. So, uh, he had this, plus there was five more air bases on the island, so it came out to be 26 square miles of base that was to be protected. I want to get real clear on this. He was Navy. His job was to patrol, just to go out and do patrol. If they were attacked and there was an invasion, his job was to support the Army, because it was the Army's job to to protect this base. It, 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 
entire Navy base was under the protection of the Army, not him. Uh, so anyway, he was supposed to, in, in order to do this, he required a lot of ships to go out and patrol. He needed a lot of airplanes to go out and patrol. He needed a lot of men to do, to, to run the ships and the airplanes, and he couldn't get them. The Army had things like this. They had 26 of these three inch World War I guns. These were stationary, just 23 to 26 of them. And they wanted 500. They had 56 of the mobile three inch guns and they wanted 500 of those. They had 109 of these 50 caliber machine guns which were old, old, right after World War I type machine guns that had a very, very short range and weren't that powerful. At 100, he wanted five, they, they wanted 500 of those. And they couldn't get them. The Army couldn't get them. And Kimmel was trying to get them for the Army and he couldn't do anything. And on top of all this, the ammunition for all those guns was World War I ammunition that was stored in caves. You go down this particular road and there's a cave, and then there's another cave, and another cave. You go down today and they've got ships' names on them because it's the ammunition for this ship, it's the ammunition for this ship. But that was all World War I ammunition. Three inch guns and five inch guns all have fuses on them. And most of the fuses were shot on this, on this shell. Were you in the Navy? Were you Army? No. Okay. Thank you for your service. Anyway, they were shooting defective ammo. A lot of this stuff was duds. A lot of the fuses didn't work. Uh, it's uh, sort of sad to say that uh, slipping into Tom's tidbit. <laughs> that wasn't good. It's sort of sad to say that uh, the civilians that passed away during this thing, there were 68 people that were killed, men, women, and children, and there was a couple hundred that were injured, and they were all injured by our defective shells not blowing up when they were supposed to. They came down and they hit people and blew up when they hit the ground in Honolulu. And no, none of the civilians were ever killed by Japanese. It was all friendly fire due to our faulty ammunition. Okay, Kimmel needed and requested 9,000 men to fill his complement or his fleet. It was written in his statement that these needs are real and immediate. He was lucky if he got a couple hundred at a time. They'd come in and they'd be as green as grass. 70% of them had never even heard a gunfire off of a ship. So he had to train them. Now Kimmel was great at training. Fantastic, everything he ever did in his past uh, was always excellent. He excelled in it because he was training his troops and he always did well. But he'd get these guys trained. This compliment would grow, and then Washington would come in and grab them and take them for Europe. So he was never growing, he <laughs> just training. And all he was doing is basically running a big old junkyard. Okay, he put in for ships, he wanted a lot of these <coughs> little ships here to go out and patrol. Understand that this is just a, a big graph of what ships were available during the war for everybody. But when he came in, they had already snuck in there uh, before he was made uh, sink back. They came in and took one of his carriers that left him with three carriers. Shortly after that, while he's in the process of asking for more ships, they come in and they take 25% of his ships. They took another carrier, they took two battleships, they took 22 destroyers, four cruisers, a whole bunch of service ships, 25% of the ships were taken. So he didn't get more, they took. So he was once again getting ripped off. He needed planes. Okay, thanks. He needed planes, and specifically he needed these type of planes. These are PBYs, they're Catalinas, they're flying boats, saved more sailors than any other vessel in World War II. Any down pilots in the water, they would get them that's another story. I can talk about 30 minutes on this plane. Okay. So he was trying to get these. And uh, 
when this atta uh, the attack hit Pearl Harbor, he had 69 of those at his base. He needed 200 to do what they wanted him to do. They wanted to do it. A 360-degree circle, 800 miles out from the park, from the pearl, and they wanted it done daily, every day, 24/7. So it would have taken 84 of these planes to fly out to cover all the sections, and that's an 18-hour day for those pilots and those planes. So those planes would go out, and they would come back, and they'd have a crew start working on the on the maintenance of the plane, and the, the actual crew would take a break, take showers, eat, rest up and another 84 would go out while these guys were sitting in recuperating. So it was like this. This is the way they could go out. Well, he only had 69. Now, I just gave you your first piece of brainwashing. That's what everybody was told. He has 69 planes. Well, he did have 69 planes parked there. 32 of them had flown in the day before on a Friday or, I'm sorry, Saturday, they were parked, the crews got out, had a few beers, got on a plane, and flew back to the United States. And just left the plane sitting there, 32 of them sitting there. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna back up. I'm ahead of my kid. 32 of them were headed for, uh, were gonna take off the next day for uh, the Philippines for MacArthur. There were 22 others were sitting on the tarmac with no crews, that's, I got ahead of myself. So 32 of them were going to MacArthur and the next day after Pearl Harbor scheduled to go. So they weren't counted. So you can't really count those as 69. And then there were 22 empty planes with no crews because the crews were sent back to the United States right off the bat. It takes six months to train a crew for these. There's eight, eight men flying the same. And then there's a four or five man maintenance crew. And they all had to be trained six months so he had 22 planes with no crews, so he was gonna to have to train them for the next six months to get crews to fly the 22. So you can't count those 22. So that leaves you down to 15 planes. He had three planes that he put in reserve. You always have to have spare parts or somebody to fly out in an emergency or if something happens real bad in one of the planes, you can always bring in another plane and use it. So he, he, was, he had six planes out in a little tiny, a little tiny area that they were doing on a 360 degree uh, search pattern. So he didn't have 69, he had 15. And of all the planes, with the exception of the six planes that were out searching, uh, all of them got destroyed on, on uh, the attack by the attack by the Japanese. This was priority target number one for the, uh, the rebel bombers and the fighters. These were the eyes of the Navy, they knew it, and those were the priority tar targets. The ships where the uh, torpedo boats came in and the uh, dive bombers, they were after the uh, carriers, no carriers. Priority two was the battleships, and they hit our battleship. Three of these survived that were there when the attack happened. And they didn't survive very well, they had, it took them a long time to get them going. So, they came in right at the beginning, took 25, but he, he had more than that. At the very beginning, they took 25 of them. Okay, he asked for barrage balloons. He never got them. You see these things in all the pictures. You wonder about them a little bit, but they're a very good defensive weapon. This cable that goes down is only an eighth of an inch thick. Very hard to see if you're flying along at 120, 150 miles an hour. And that cable, you get one of the cables, it doesn't just snag, it snaps off. It snaps off at the top, actually rips the flap off so the gas leaves the, the uh, balloon and it goes straight down. And these two cables are hanging off your wing and they're going back here and they have a timed explosion on each end that opens up a parachute. And that parachute, when it opens up, it rips the wing off or the tail section, wherever that cable hooked on your plane, that gets ripped off. If it doesn't get ripped off right away, the wind's making it go like this and it just saws through whatever it's attached to. So, it's a good defensive weapon. You can't fly under it. That would have eliminated any attack by torpedo planes that come in real low. Didn't get them. Never even got a word of why he didn't get them. He tried to get uh, uh, torpedo nets. He 
couldn't get those. Uh, they were told that they were too expensive. He, he was told they were too expensive, too heavy, take too long to put on, and way too long to take off. If you have to leave port in a hurry, you're going to end up spending two or three hours getting these things off. So he didn't get them. And they told him, you won't need them anyway. The water's 42 feet deep. Torpedoes won't work in 42 foot of water. It's too shallow. You have to have 75 feet of water or 80 feet of water because the torpedoes will just go right into the mud and the bottom if you don't. Two shots. And this mentality was going all over. Uh, nobody paid any attention to what the British were doing. The British blew what they call a little, little bike, a little swordfish, and it had torpedoes on it, and they went into Marsdale Kabir over in North Africa. Beer, and they shot a torpedo and sank a little ship that blew up and destroyed, pretty well destroyed the battleship next to it. 24 <coughs> foot of water. 24 foot of water, that torpedo was. Then they went across the Mediterranean, they did the same thing in a place called Kabar, and they hit uh, the battleship Richelieu, and they, just, they put it out of action for six or seven months with one torpedo in water that was about 30 foot deep. And then they flew to the boot hill for Italy to a place called Toronto, which was a major base for their Navy. And they flew in at night with these little old swordfish planes and they sunk one battleship and ended up practically, well, they disabled two other battleships. Uh, so they were out of action for seven or eight months using torpedoes in some cases 20 foot of water. We had one lieutenant there that was uh, observing. He drew a map of what, where the torpedoes went in, and he had the depth where the torpedoes went in. And in almost every case, it was under 30 foot. So this story that all of our brains and all of our people thought uh, it had to be 75 foot of water, it wasn't. Of course, Japan was in there just like that after that attack. They wanted to find out how they did it. And so was Germany. We just kind of looked at the paper and poof, they went away. We were pretty arrogant back in those days. So we didn't get those. <clears throat> Kimmel wasn't hanging on by a shoe string. He was hanging on by a thread. And you want to know why he was doing that? Well, Admiral Bull Halsey said it real clearly in one of his articles that he wrote. And I'll just let you, I'll read along here. Who then is to blame? Look at it logically. The attack succeeded because Admiral Kimmel and General, Sh General Short could not give Pearl Harbor adequate protection. They did not have it to give. They did not have it because Congress would not authorize it. Instead of trying to dodge our responsibilities by searching two splendid officers, we should be big enough to acknowledge our mistakes. We had gone isolationist. From World War I, we just did not want to go back to war. We had people walking up and down the streets with arms missing. They're wearing masks because their face is so disfigured from World War I. No legs in their chairs and stuff. So people did not want to go back to war. And they were protesting. And they were voting in like-minded people. You have two candidates arguing, say, well, I'm, I, we should be in there helping Italy, uh, uh, England, we should be fighting against Hitler right now. This guy saying, no, we shouldn't be doing anything, we should stay out of it, we should cut back on everything. That's the man that got voted in. And, uh, Why do you exercise your right of General Smedley from World War I. I love the speech. <laughs> he, he was something. Uh, I like it. You can watch the whole thing, the sleeves just keep rolling up and rolling down, rolling up and rolling down. Just rolling up. Okay, here is the 1941 Congress of the United States. It has 18 Republicans and the rest are Democrats. Almost all of them were anti war. Uh, most of the Republicans wanted to go and fight with England and, and support England. Some of the Democrats did too, but the majority did not. And I like 
think this is a good Congress because how often you find a Congress that was doing what they were elected to do. The people wanted not to spend money on war, and they did. So it was a good Congress. Yeah, but they wouldn't spend a nickel. Kimmel couldn't get his shoelaces because they wouldn't see him a dime. Okay, we also had people like George Marshall saying that they had turned. They tried to do more for General MacArthur instead of helping Kimmel. And uh, the struggle was that time to give the Philippines adequate stuff. So stuff was being pulled away from Kimmel and going to uh, the Philippines. We had people warning us. You guys recognize Billy Mitchell? 20 years before, he said, Pearl Harbor will be attacked by Japan. It'll be at eight o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning. It'll be a complete surprise attack before they announce that they're at war and they'll use torpedoes. 20 years before, <coughs> he was run out, of the, run out of the Air Force. He was demoted, put in some little backwater office and just retired. And then after he died, uh, Roosevelt, who didn't like him, uh, changed his mind after this attack at Pearl Harbor and decided he did like him, gave him a promotion, brought him up, gave him his rank right back, and then gave him another promoted, promotion, but this was posthumously. He, didn't, he wasn't alive. Built a statue for him. Folks, that's what you do. And that's what we've always done for officers who have been found guilty of something and punished. And then when they found out that they were no longer guilty, they were not really guilty, they always, always got their rank back. There's only been two men in the history of the United States military who were found guilty and then found not guilty, who did not get their rank back. One was Kimmel and one was Short. So they're still trying to get the rank back. This gentleman here, Hector Bywater, was a British spy. About uh, 10 or 12 years before Pearl Harbor, he wrote a documentary using facts and big military facts and figures, stuff that he dug up. And basically he said, we're going to be attacked by Japan. They're going to use torpedoes. It's going to be at 8 o'clock in the morning. It's going to be on a Sunday morning, and they're going to declare war after the fact. He nailed it, except he didn't know about Pearl Harbor. He put it all in the Philippines. Extra by one. Told it. And he wrote a novel about it when, when uh, uh, President Hoover got all upset with him about this stuff. Uh, they had a little verbal argument in public, so he just went back and wrote a novel. So turned out he was right. Uh, Secretary of the Navy uh, Frank Knox wrote a letter to Secretary of War stating if war eventuates with Japan, it is believed easily possible that hostilities would be initiated by a surprise attack upon the fleet or the naval base at Pearl Harbor. Everything so far is beginning to point to Pearl Harbor. These are things happen this one happened 10 months before. His entire letter, his entire letter to the uh, Secretary of War is in, is reprinted in the uh, uh, commission that was that found him guilty, the Roberts Commission. We interrupted this man's mail. We got a couple of his letters. One letter said, the way to win the coming war. They had already known that they were going to war, the coming war. It didn't say a possible war or any kind of war, conflict if we were to have one or anything like that. It was the coming war. They were already, they were already planning. And it was that the United States was to start by destroying the U.S. Pacific Fleet and surprise preemptive strike on Pearl Harbor. We got this one about oh, five or six months before Pearl Harbor. Second letter that we got was a letter to a friend of his, and he just casually mentioned I've been really busy making plans to attack Pearl Harbor. We asked him after the attack, uh, where did you get your plans? How did you figure out your plan? And he said, I read Hector Bywater's book. So Hector shouldn't have written a book. So, okay, we had spies out there. We had tons of spies. All of these guys did something 
that brought it right up front, Pearl Harbor's going to be attacked. He thought some spies, every document in their records was for Pearl Harbor. This guy here, the handsome looking guy here, is James Bond. The book about James Bond is based on him. His boss was Ian Fleming, who wrote the books, and he based it on this guy. He had all kinds of stuff. He was a double agent. This guy here told us eight times that we were going to be hit by at Pearl Harbor before Christmas. Gave our, one of our senators a book of war plans that he stole from the Japanese. It didn't get interpreted until two weeks after the attack, and it was a step-by-step -step narrative on attacking Pearl Harbor. They had their plans, and there they were in that book. He gave them the book, and nobody would look at it. This gentleman here, the uh, ambassador from Peru was in Japan. He called our ambassador and said, the ships have just sailed. They're on their way to Pearl Harbor. And he had his network of spies call us and said that they were going. Our ambassador called somebody. And then he wrote in his diary that, diary that night that uh, uh, he certainly hopes that the boys at Pearl Harbor are not exactly asleep. That they're on their way. We had stuff like this going all the time. Everyone's bushels of information about Pearl Harbor. Not Guam, not the uh, Philippines, not Midway, not any, not even on the coast of the oceans or anything. All of it was pointing directly at Pearl Harbor. And our people kept saying, too shallow, too far, they're going to hit the Philippines. Nobody would pay any attention to what we were doing. We captured their spies. This guy had tons of stuff, and file cabinets full of stuff, all on Pearl Harbor. This guy was in Pearl Harbor, lived about two blocks away from the Kimmel. That's a master spy. They finally got him, and it was a room full of file cabinets and suitcases full of information about Pearl Harbor. His last message to Japan was in a very simple code that nobody bothered decoding. They, they knew what he was doing, but nobody bothered. And he figured it out. He says, okay, I've been sending all this stuff. And in his very last sentence, he says, the ships are all well lined up for a surprise attack. He figured it out. Every one of those of our spies figured it out. England figured it out. When they sent that James Bond guy over here, they figured it out. The James Bond guy, the FBI, <coughs> wouldn't pay any attention. And I'll tell you why. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover was given, along with that document, the documents that they were supposed to be trying to help England with, there was a telegram, and the telegram had eyes, the little, the little letter eyes. And a lady in England had figured out that if you take those little eyes off, the dot off the eye, and put it down and magnify it, it was a message. They called them uh, micro dots. And that's the first time anybody did any micro dots. Here's a questionnaire where Germany is trying to get 61 answers about things in Pearl Harbor. J. Edgar Hoover ignored all of that and went to the president. Look what I figured out. He took credit for it. Some young girl in England figured it all out and told him how to do it. And then he comes back two days later and says, look, I've made them smaller. Totally ignored the important stuff. Well, these guys were German spies, and they were in Honolulu, <coughs> and uh, they were found guilty and sentenced to death by musketry. Mm. Uh, we didn't we didn't kill them. We sent them back to Germany. Then we had this thing. This is called purple. It's called purple because there was one in '32 that was called red, and one in '34 that was called white, and one in '36 that was blue. That white blue. So when this one came out, it was all the colors mixed together, the native purple. Diplomatic codes only. Just the different Japanese diplomatic code would go in one side, Japanese would come out the other side, translators would change it over, and we were reading Japanese diplomatic codes faster than the diplomats. Uh, our machine was better. People looked at that thing and they called it magic and the, that nickname stuck. So throughout the talk, you'll hear purple or you'll hear magic. We're talking about that machine right there. 
looks horrible, doesn't it? But it worked. So all of this information pointing right straight at Pearl Harbor, the information about the shallow water and the deep water, all that stuff was never sent to Kemper. Never got anything. Kept in the dark. Come on. I got that one going way too slow. Okay, he did get a hint one time about something. Some guy slipped up and told him something that wasn't supposed to be. So he called his commander, and the commander came back and said, we place no credence in these rumors. Furthermore, based on what's known data regarding, regarding the present disposition and employment of Japanese naval and army forces, no move against Pearl Harbor is planned, imminent or planned, in the foreseeable future. Four weeks later, we were being bombed. Just one little tiny inkling he got. And there we are getting hit. Okay, two hours later, the Japanese declared war. A few hours later, Roosevelt met with his cabinet and brought in several congressmen. Uh, he read his prepared document about what was happening in Pearl Harbor to all these people. The room was deathly quiet. And afterwards, this man stood up, Senator Tom Connolly. I really like Mr. Connolly. He, he wanted to go to war right off the bat. I mean, he's a Democrat. So, but he, he thinks like the public was thinking. He was taking in all the garbage that was being given to him, uh, to the public, and he thought like the public. And so he was wrong on a lot of things. And I'm going to use him to kind of as a guide on here. He said, Hell's fire. What was Kimmel doing? Well, I guess, you know, Kimmel was standing there watching the ships blow up and, and, and making comments about this attack had to have started a year ago to be this effective. Look at all the different waves it took. It must have had four or five carriers. And they were actually complimenting the Japanese on how efficient it was and then realized it had been planned for over a year and they've been talking peace to us for over a year. So we knew right off the bat that they never really wanted peace. So Kimmel was doing that, but before the attack, Kimmel came in and within two or three weeks of taking that office, he, he sent out 82 general orders. One of them was that there's never going to be more than one fourth of the fleet in Pearl Harbor at any one time. And people swear up and down that the whole fleet was in there. They knew the carriers weren't, but they said they were thinking, and the, the media and the gossip had the entire fleet in there getting sunk. The carriers were out, and the carriers would have three or four cruisers around them and five or ten destroyers around them. Most of the cruisers were out, and a lot of the destroyers were out, and people still thought the whole crew was in there, but it wasn't. Another thing he wrote down was, uh, he made a general order was, uh, every ship in harbor will have one fourth of its guns loaded, the ammo boxes around them are gonna be full with overflow, lots of ammo there, and there's gonna be a crew manning the one fourth of the guns, sitting right there with the gun, and the gun's gonna be loaded, all you gotta do is cock want that going 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a week. So one fourth of all of the guns in Pearl Harbor were manned and ready. In addition, all of the guns that were not manned were loaded. All they had to be is cocked. Ammo boxes were full. Kimmel was running drills. And the men didn't like him so much for that because he was constantly running drills on a ship you have stations, you have your sleep station, that's where your, your bunk is. You have your workstation, that is, and you might be a, a painter or an electrician or a plumber or whatever you are. You had a place where you work, and then you had a battle station. And the battle station was always just three minutes away from the other two stations. So they had to practice going to their battle station and be there in three minutes. That was the mandatory thing, three minutes. And he would run these drills over and over and over again. 
a ship, just for you guys to know, is a series of one ways. On a ship, if you're going to your battle station, you go up the ladders on the starboard side and forward. If you're going to the aft, you come down the port side and you go down the ladder. So it's constantly a one way all the, all the way around the ship. So there's none of this banging in. So these guys would get out there and they wouldn't make the three minutes. They'd get all upset and mad and they didn't like Kimmel. Then all of a sudden, somebody made the three minutes and they began to get a little proud. And then it was like golf. They wanted to beat that guy. And they'd come in two minutes and 45 seconds. And they look at the guys in the next dump. Are you guys still going three and a half minutes? Nah. You know, so it became a competition. And then they started getting pride. <laughs> and then they started liking Kimmel because they realized that he had made them really, <coughs> really efficient and professional. So they, his men loved him. I'll give you one quick example. They were running a drill. There was a man asleep on the deck. It was a hot day or hot night. So he was sleeping up under one of the gun tubs where it was cool. And the drill went off. The klaxon horn went off and he runs and gets out from it. He's just in his skivvies, his underwear. So he's pulling on his pants and this drunk old boy hollers out, don't waste time getting dressed, get to your station. And he looked up and there's Kimmel sitting up there looking down at him and Kimmel standing there in his underwear. <laughs> so they understood that even he was being drilled. So it was, it was, that's the kind of man he was, <coughs> and, the, and the men loved him for it. So that's what he was doing. He was training, he was getting things ready. Uh, there's another thing here, what was it? It was supposed to be on alert. Well, we've already gone through that. And some of them were asleep because that was their shift to sleep. You have watches, you have four watches on a ship, each one six hours long. So that ship is going 24 hours a day. So if you've got cooks cooking for four hours for six hours, when they leave, you've got to have another bunch of cooks come in and cook for the next six hours, and another bunch for the next six hours, and the next. Sometimes they've got to sleep. So anywhere from one fourth to half of them were asleep, which is normal. I mean, they had to. And another thing they kept saying was that the men had been out Saturday night and they had gotten all drunk and they came back and they were all hung over. That wasn't the truth either. Kimmel had stopped the Liberty, stopped all the passes, <coughs> way back before Thanksgiving. Those ships were, those men were confined to the ship. They didn't get off for anything. So they weren't getting drunk. They were doing their work and doing drills instead of enjoying themselves for a Saturday or a Sunday off. So those guys, they weren't drunk. If anybody got caught drunk, they went right to the grave. Okay, why do we have them crowded together? Well, that's kind of a good question. Uh, it's for easy supply. You can bring a, a supply boat up and load this ship with everything and it just gets handed over to the next ship. You know, they just load two ships at the same time. And basically that's what it was. And these ships were in there being ready for war. If you were driving from New York City to San Diego and you had your kids in the car, and it was a vacation. You check your tires, you check your tire pressure, you change your oil, your spark plugs, you tune it up, make sure your windshield wipers were working and all that. You were going to be very careful that your car was going to make the trip and get back. That's what Kimmel was doing. He was getting his battleships ready for war. He just didn't know how soon it was going to actually change. So uh, there was one ship up on a dry dock. They had one dry dock. The dry dock lifts them up out of the water and they can scrape the barnacles off. You guys know what a barnacle is? A little round shellfish about that big around, like a suction cup, and it's shaped like a volcano. And it is it's sharp and attack you can't hardly you don't want to walk on it because it cuts your feet up. And it's got a little animal and little hands come out and go grab food like this. It reproduces very fast. If you get a build up of those on the bottom of your ship, it can slow a ship like a battleship, it can slow it down by five knots. You're doing a battleship doing 28 knots, you're doing five knots, you're doing a 23 uh, knots. So makes that old battleship a perfect target. Can't hardly turn, can't go anywhere. So, uh, they clean the barnacles off, they paint it. They've got new paint now that barnacles can't stick to. Okay, the, the uh, 
logs that he said Kip couldn't get out. He didn't know. The, the, the logs are like this. They overlap. There's a tugboat on this one, a tugboat on this one. The things, the tugboat take them open and open them up. And then they close it. Now they will not open this way. So you cannot get in, but you can easily get out if the tugboat's open. If the tugboats get shot, sunk, or whatever, or if they're not working, if something happens and there's no tugboat, a destroyer can come from inside and nose up against that thing and just push it open. And the other, and the, and just, they can get out. You can't, that's not going to stop a, a, a battleship. Those things just hit it, hit with their nose, and destroy it open. So it was not to keep the ship in, it was to keep the enemy out. So he didn't know. He didn't know. Didn't need to do anything. Okay. Watch me if I get angry. <laughs> <laughs> you know the signals. All right. We throw nothing. All right, Our boys. Every one of them. The ones that lived and the ones that died. Every one of our boys on, in Pearl Harbor should have a statue for them in their hometown. Their high school should be named after them. But these guys were proficient. I just told you how they were all making it to their post in three minutes. Let me tell you what was going on. The first attack came in, there was 40 torpedo ships came in. And they were five minutes ahead of their schedule. So their support planes, the ones that were supposed to support them, fighters, were far enough back that they weren't seen. These 40 planes came in, dropped 25 torpedoes, 23 of them hit, and they were gone in 11 minutes. Now that was quick. And you know, our boys could get the guns in three minutes. And the flag on the flagship that tells everybody it's wartime, guys, get, go to your stations and start shooting. That flag was going up when the second batch of ships came in, and these were dive bombers. The first bomb was coming down, the flag was going up. The first plane shot were the torpedo planes. The last five torpedo planes that were attacking the ship were all shot down. Our boys got into action that quick. In that first 11 minutes, they got into action, they had their guns going, and they started shooting planes down and shot all the last five planes down. That's what we got the, the first, uh, the first uh, we got nine, we shot down nine in that first attack. 383 uh, plane, Japanese planes in that, they shot down in the first wave nine, and that would be 5%. The second wave came in, it was 170 planes, and we shot down 20 of those. Now some of those were shot down by our pilots. Our pilots were able to get a few planes up and they shot them down. Uh, out of that, that would have been like 8% of what the, what the attacking force was. But you put it all together, all those numbers change. We've got 353 planes total. We shot down 29. That comes out to be 14%, I think. 14% or 12%. Oh no, 8%. Only 8%. So that's the way they show it, 8%. They shot down 8% of those planes. And if you go on Google, just type in Google when you get a chance. And, and how many planes did we shoot down at Pearl Harbor? 29, 29, 29, 29, 29, 29 everything. It's 29, 29, 29, 29. Okay? That's propaganda. That's brainwashing. Let's go and read the Japanese record. Let's go look at Admiral Nagumo, the guy that was in charge of the Japanese war, his after action report. He said this, we surprised the Americans totally, but within five minutes, it was as if we had not surprised them at all because of the amount of anti-aircraft fire in the air. I think I had another picture come up to it. You don't ever see this picture from Pearl Harbor. You see the big ships are going down. You see the U.S. Shaw shooting out old white yellow streets and, and the, the Arizona blowing up a big ball. You don't see us fighting back. Here we are fighting back. Those are anti-aircraft shells, five-inch guns and three-inch guns. We were filling the sky up. 
and you don't get this. You, have anybody ever seen this picture? Mm -mm. You see all the standard stuff. We were fighting back, and that, I guess the the people that are in charge of all that didn't want us to know that we were fighting back. We were really going. If Nagumo, well, let's keep on with what he had. He said after both attacks and all the planes had returned, there were 111 planes that were severely damaged and couldn't fly anymore and had to go below decks. Now, of that 111, 20 or more, in his reports, 20 or more, we don't know how many more, so we'll just say one. So 21 of those ships were so badly damaged they just shoved them off the side of the ship. My way of thinking, those planes got shot down. The, the, the column is destroyed by our boys, shooting bullets through them. The bullets were supposed to blow up. These shells were supposed to blow up and they weren't blowing up, but we shot through them and made big holes, and maybe we hit uh, the engine and knocked it out, or we might have killed the pilot, or whatever. We did enough damage with dud stuff that they, they ended up rolling 20, uh, uh, 21 of them off the ship. So now, you take the, the 90 that went below decks and couldn't be used again, you take 50 planes, that were destroyed by our boys instead of the 29 that you're all hearing about. 50 of them, according to Nagumo. That left the 213 planes left to fly that he had left to, to attack. Everybody criticizes him for leaving and not attacking the oil bank, the oil reserves. And I know exactly what he's thinking. He's got no radar. He doesn't know where they are, aircraft carriers. He's lost 40% of his planes if he sends another flight in, by then our cruisers and destroyers will have been assembled at the, all around the islands and they would start shooting nine miles out. These planes would be coming in flat and level, easy targets, and just fly in and they had to fly <coughs> through the gauntlet. And he, we would have shot down, no telling how many planes we would have shot down just trying to get to the island. And if we got to the island, we would have had our ships rearranged. We would have had, uh, well, our ships were pretty well arranged. They were arranged like circling the wagons around the island. So we had a 360 degree field of fire to begin with. But uh, Kimball did that too. And uh, we would have we blown, we probably have shot down another 200 planes. You don't know what, what we would have got. Another 150, 170. We were getting better every attack. I know that. So he knew that if they lost any more planes, they would have absolutely no protection for his big, four big carriers, his two small carriers, and his battleship. So he left, and that was the smart thing to do, because had he not, we would have nailed him. <laughs> so uh, that's stuff that you just don't hear. You don't hear us fighting back. You don't hear what the actual damage was that we did. And that's what made me so proud of our boys, is because I'm thinking 29, 29, petty stuff, you know. Uh, they beat the snot out of those Japanese, and nobody knows it. When you knock out 40% of their attacking force, they're surprising you. That's amazing. Okay, the American public's getting very angry. They want to blame somebody. Roosevelt's getting very nervous, getting scared, because his name is popping up. So are a lot of other civilians. And, and the secretaries of states and secretaries of war and stuff like that. And uh, so he decides he's gonna make a scapegoat. So how do you create a scapegoat? Well, first of all, you pick your victim. And in this case, they had picked Walter Short. He was the victim. It was his job to protect the Navy, and he did it. And he was the perfect target to make for a scapegoat. In walks this guy, Secretary of War, uh, Frank, uh, Frank Stimson. And uh, I don't think that's his name. His last name is Stimson, I can't remember what his first name is. Stimson walks in, and he's looking over the shoulder of uh, George Marshall and, a few, and the president and a few other things. He says, oh, you're cleaning house. Yeah, we're cleaning house. We're gonna take and, and blame uh, uh, Short for everything. And he says, well, you can't blame it all on the Army. You need to do the Navy, too, so put Kimmel in there. 
Kimmel was not even considered until he opened his big mouth. And this is the guy that got Kimmel nominated to become a scapegoat. So now you didn't have one victim, you had two victims. So, shorten everything. Okay, on December 15th, President Roosevelt, 1941, December 15th, Roosevelt calls a, a meeting. Okay, and, and when he calls a meeting, uh, you have to, the people who go in there have to sign in. So we know exactly when they went into this meeting and exactly when they came out. These guys were called in, the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, and Commander of Naval Operations, Harold Starr. Harold is a 40-year friend to Kimball. They've been buddies for 40 years and uh, very close to they're in there for 15 minutes because they sign out 15 minutes later. Now you know that's not a planning meeting. He's telling them what's about to happen. And he's giving them 15 minutes and telling them to keep their mouths shut because this is gonna happen. They're gone, 15 minutes later, they're gone. A few minutes later, these two guys sign in. Secretary of War Stimson and George uh, Marshall, General Marshall. Now these two guys, were in the planning to begin with. They know what's going on, so he's not telling them anything they don't know. They're just probably having some kind of a little casual conversation until the next guy comes. This guy signs in 20 minutes after they do. This is Owen Roberts, Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. He's a mean man. Nobody likes him. He was not put in office by uh, Roosevelt. He was, he was a justice before Roosevelt came in. Uh, nobody liked him. Uh, he's the only justice to ever retire who did not get a letter saying thank you for your service. <laughs> <laughs> they made one and nobody would sign it. So <laughs> they, they just gave up on it and they made another one reworded, they wouldn't sign that one either. So he's the only justice ever to retire that didn't get a little letter of knowledge on, you did a great job with this, and, and we're so thankful that you were able to handle this, and on and on, all, patting him on the back. He didn't get any pats at all, he got the boot. And so he was a mean guy. Uh, he did vote for, uh, uh, I've already told you that, the president didn't put him in. He did vote for most of the New Deal, New, New Deal, legislation by Roosevelt. Uh, he was a lot of times the deciding vote. So Roosevelt owed him a, a thank you for getting some of his programs in back when the Depression was going. Uh, the only thing he would not vote for was if it was racist. And that that's the only good thing I could find out about. He voted no on moving the Japanese out of California and putting them in the camps. He voted no if it was anything anything at all racist. So he was definitely against race, against racism. Okay, so they had a chat that lasted two hours. All four of them in there talking. They all signed out four of them. The other three guys signed out two hours later. And this was <coughs> sent to the press. And it <coughs> pretty well, it pretty well clears all civilian authority. It's just on the part of U.S. Army or Navy personnel. Doesn't say anything at all about civilian authority. They've eliminated all the civilians. And along with this, when it went out to the press, was a letter saying, this commission is gonna to get to the bottom of all of this stuff. They're gonna dig and dig and dig and they're gonna find out the absolute truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Well, that little quote made the headlines all across the United States. Truth, <coughs> the truth, and nothing but the truth. If you look at the San Francisco Chronicle and all these things on this day, there, that's what they're putting. Direct quote from Roosevelt. The truth. So here they are. They don't know it, but they're being brainwashed. When this report comes out, it's going to be the truth. There's not going to be a lie. We're going to find out. You're going to see. We're going to find out. So that's just the kind of stuff that he threw out to them. This is your commission. You had Admiral 
William Stanley here on the left, uh, he was the one good guy. He tried to help as best he could. Of course, Justice Owen Roberts is not looking too bad in this picture. He's not as mean looking in this picture. We got a follower here in Admiral Joseph M. Reed. And you've got Brigadier General Joseph McNarney. He's the only active man here. The rest of them are all retired. And you've got Major General Frank R. McCoy. Uh, <coughs> I call this uh, court, I call it a kangaroo court. Because that's what it was. It was just a court designed to find somebody guilty. Kangaroo court. She's looking around, what's that sound? That's a train coming. And why is the train coming? Because they were getting ready to railroad Kimmel and Short into being guilty. When they had to get all that finished and done, they had railroaded him. And he was guilty. Now, all the guilty people that were out there, and there were lots of them, and they knew they were guilty took a breath of fresh air because they all of a sudden, they weren't on the list anymore. So, yeah, they were happy. <laughs> yeah, we were happy. Okay, so, let's do the first meeting, the first three days of meetings here. This guy, and I'll show you, it's illegal right from the beginning. It's illegal right from the beginning. You got uh, Reeves, you got uh, Robert Reeves, and you got McCarney, and you got uh, McCoy. Now they hold a meeting in Washington, a three days meeting. They talk, they talk to Simpson, the Secretary of War, Secretary of Navy Frank Knox, uh, General Marshall. General Marshall was in on two of those days of meeting. He was, this was not an interrogation, folks. This was a planning meeting, okay? So they were in there doing stuff. Uh, Stark was in there. This guy here, you haven't, I haven't told you about him, but this is a guy named is General Turner, Kelly Turner. He came into the office and became his right-hand man. He, he thought that he was great. Is anybody related to Kelly Turner? Good, because he's a jerk. <laughs> he came in and the first thing he did was go to the office of ONI, the Office of Naval Intelligence, and demand that all secret documents go across his desk first. He, this was fourth in command. You had the president, you had King, who was the uh, uh, chief of staff, and you had him, and then you had Kimmel. Well, he thought he'd fit right in with this guy. He wasn't, he, he, but whenever this guy was asked a question, he answered. Whenever they asked him to do something, he would have Turner do it. Turner became the mouth for this man. This guy uh, that was a friend to uh, Kimmel was great at organization. He was terrible at handling men. He just let this guy go crazy and do whatever he wanted. This guy here had all those secret documents and stood right in front of Kimmel, told him face to face, I'm sending you all the messages so you're going to see everything. Never send a thing. Never. Turner. Then you had this gentleman here, his name is Wilkinson, Admiral Wilkinson. They called him back from retirement. His job was to take over, he hadn't taken it yet, but his job was to take over the Office of Naval Intelligence a week after this stuff. And when he did, that guy got some serious trouble because he came in and took it all back and this guy got reprimanded and, and busted back down, gave him a little cruiser or something sail around there. And he was no longer doing what he wanted to do. This is uh, General Sherman Miles, who's Director of Military Intelligence. And this guy here's name is Rufus Brett. Colonel Rufus Brett. You guys know who he was? You see the movie Torah, Torah, Torah? Remember this guy? That's Rufus. He's the guy that went around all over Washington, always trying to get people to read these messages and tell them, look, it's going to be Pearl Harbor. Look, it's coming. He was trying to get people to pay attention, and none of the higher authorities would. They had 10 people that could see these messages. 
when they came in to see them, they just looked at them, they signed, and they weren't allowed to keep them. They just read, read them, and they signed that they had read them. He was trying to convince them that something was bad was about to happen, and nobody would listen to him. That's Rufo. He was interrogated. Okay. Now, some of these guys are guilty. Some of these guys are very guilty. Some are not. Rufus is not guilty. Miles is not guilty. He's not guilty. He didn't have anything to do with it. But these top row, every one of them was guilty. If they were not guilty of the errors in judgment, they were just guilty because they made a lot of mistakes. And I, I would say that most of this stuff was mistakes. So, what made it illegal? They did it without their fifth man. Stanley was not present. Stanley blew his staff. He was mad. And he looks like a sweet little old man, but he's an admiral. He didn't get that way by being nice. He could, he could come off the floor with both fists swinging. So he, he let them have it. He said, okay, when you interview these guys, did you subpoena them? No, we didn't subpoena them. Uh, did you swear them in? Oh, we didn't swear them in. Uh, did you have stenographers take down what was said? No, we didn't have stenographers. So he said, all of these guys were potentially guilty. All of them could say or not say anything they wanted and could never be held accountable because you didn't do it the right way. And basically, that was what it was. It was more of a plan than anything anyway. Uh, after that, they started doing all the stuff that he was just talking about. From that time on, they said, they, and it's interesting because the stenographer thing, with, it was, when it started going in Hawaii, the stenographers were handled by uh, Roberts, Owen Roberts. And these guys, I think he found all the stenographers, I think he found them in the monkey section of the zoo. Because whenever it got the testimony that Kimmel was giving, or somebody was giving in favor of Kimmel, the spelling went to the shambles. They spelled the word, words, a word, four, four letters. It would come out Z-D-K-B, or something like that. Totally, totally. <coughs> I mean, Kimmel was able to get those records, and it took an all, a day and a half, uh, an all night, one night, and translate them as best he could. And he brought them back in, and Stanley tried to get those entered into the record. Roberts wouldn't let him. No, you're not changing our records. We'll keep them just the way they were. So he did get them added on to the back, what we call an addendum. And uh, that was the best they could do. OK, the Roberts Commission. I wonder what's going to come up next. Oh, 21 pages were released to the public, 2,000 pages that were not released to the public, <laughs> and those are what are forever hidden away from a lot of stuff is on. Uh, page one, paragraph one, basically the purpose of the commission, and we've already gone over that, we know what that was all about, it was to find a guilty party. Uh, I'm not gonna go through every page and every paragraph, folks. We're actually almost done. The Roberts Commission Report, section one, pretty well cleared all of these people. It, some way or another, mentioned their jobs, somehow or another, cleared them. Generally, 90% of all this stuff was a pack of lies. They cleared the Congress too. So the commission held three meetings in Washington. Uh, I think you just saw that. Uh, the rules, all right, the rules. Kimmel was not allowed to counsel illegal. He was not given the right to ask questions. Illegal. He was, could not cross-examine. He was not allowed to call witnesses. Uh, what else came up here? If he asked if he could do any of these things, he was told it was not a trial. Can't find somebody guilty if it's not a trial, but they did. In some cases, it was, he was removed from the room so he couldn't hear. Kim on in short would deny all the rights that were given to a citizen standing before a judicial proceeding. This thing was totally and completely illegal. And the guilty stuff was based on one big lie. Paragraph one. 
put this in because it's kind of gives you an idea how we twisted things around. It's true. We have found that due to the enormous demand on the nation's capacity to produce munitions and war supplies, there was a deficiency in the provisions of material for the Hawaiian area. This is but natural. <laughs> and that's not my underlying. They underline it. Though. In the circumstances, and it was well known to the government departments and local commanders. We have made no detailed findings on the subject since, as will appear from the report, our report, we find that this deficiency did not affect the critical fact of failure to take appropriate measures with the means available. In other words, we're not giving you what you want, but it doesn't matter that you should have done something. That's like telling the Marines that here's your, here's your foxhole, protect it. Here's your rifle. Uh, where's my bullets? Oh, if we're out of those, and that's only natural. But then when you get run over and killed, you know, he should have taken measures. Then should not have been, he should have killed all 10,000 of the guys that were attacking, attacking whatever. But it's totally ridiculous. This is totally ridiculous. Of course, you won't see that in the paper. This is the lie. Right here. The most serious charge was that Kimmel and Short did not communicate with each other because they hated each other and refused to meet. When Kimmel first came in there and met with him, uh, he sat down with uh, Short and said, uh, he, he told his, his staff he was going to be friends or he was going to go to war. He sat down with uh, Short and said, I need your help. He never ever told Short how to do his job. Short never told Kimmel how to do his job. So they got along well. Then they started meeting and then they started playing golf every weekend. They became friends. Golf. They had meetings. They would get these messages and the Army would send one and the Navy would send one. They looked at them and they couldn't figure them out. It's what I call gobble the gook. Is that word? Sounds familiar to me. Is that something I just made up? Anyway, it was a mess. You, you, you take your fleet and you do this with that and you do that with this and this and this. And then two days later, you get your report back and another suggestion, you do this and you do that and do that instead of what I told you to do two days ago. And it's just a bunch of garbage. They could not figure out what they were supposed to do. These were just letters rambling and none of them were ordered. Kimmel only got one order. I hope I'm not repeating myself. Come on. Kimmel got one order, and that order was, this is a war warning, proceed to directions in the war, uh, in, uh, in our war plans, number such and such. We're going to war. And he got that, in other words, it was an order. Move your ships as you're supposed to according to your order. And uh, he got that eight hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Eight hours later. That's when you see in Torah, 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 you wad it up and throws it in the wastebasket. That's what it was. It was that stupid order that came eight hours later telling them, hey, we're going to war. Be ready. Too late. But in all that time, to give you an example, Kemmel and Short met on December 2nd for an hour. They met on December 4th for an hour. They met on December 6th for two hours. And what they're saying, they hated each other and refused to meet. They had it down in some, some articles, newspaper articles, and one senator got up one time and said, if, if they saw him coming down the street, he'd cross the street so he wouldn't have to talk to him. They were friends. And it was obvious to everybody there that they, it was a, it's like I said, it's a big lie. Okay, this is the one that got into their election to do. In the light of warnings and directions to take appropriate action, transmitted to both commanders between November 27th and December 7th, and the obligation under the system of coordination, then in effect for joint cooperative action on their part, it was a derelict a duty on the part of each of them not to consult and confer with the other respecting the means and intent of the warnings and the appropriate measures. They had to consult. They had to. Because they couldn't figure out what the people were talking about. So they were constantly meeting 
just to try to figure out what these measures and notes and stuff meant. But they were friends and they did consult the church. They're saying they did it and that the fair election would be an outright vulgar lie. You know it now, don't you? Okay. All right. Paragraph 18, page 20. It's only 20 pages, folks. We're already on it. Yeah. All right. This is the one that got him an error of the judgment. This one here, I just, I lived on. I just banged my head. The Japanese attack was complete surprise to the commanders, and they failed to make suitable dispositions to meet such an attack. Each failed properly to evaluate the seriousness of the situation. These errors of judgment were the effective causes for the success of the attack. Folks, it was a complete surprise. How do you make suitable disposition for something you don't know is coming? That's like driving your car through an intersection and getting hit by a Mack truck coming through the and getting blamed because the gates in that truck got broken and you didn't. You didn't take proper precautions. It's stupid, stupid, stupid. They couldn't. You can't make plans for a tax. They, of course, we know that Kimball did. I mean, look what <coughs> happened. What the boys actually did. He actually did make it. But they're saying he didn't, and they said he should have. And they, first sentence is complete surprise. Okay, this document went to George Marshall. George Marshall had it for a day and a night and made changes to it. He turned it over to the president the next morning. The president has this group of people in there, the witness on it, and he's reading it with his finger like this. Oh man, this is terrible. Like this, and just tisking and all this stuff. And when he gets finally through it all, he holds it up and says, is there anything in here that's secret that cannot be shown to the American people? His advisor said, no, there isn't. So he says, Max, Max, come in here. Max is his orderly. Get this out to the press and have them print it in its entirety. Now, what has he had the press doing? The press has been telling everybody that this thing is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Supposed to print it in their entirety. What did they print? Kimball, in short, guilty of uh, judgments and uh, errors in judgment and, and the other thing. Well, it was basically the truth, because he, he, he had been pounding it into the, it was going to be the truth. So that, right there, he made the scapegoat. He made everybody at that point hate Kimball and short, because he had convinced the world that that report was going to be the truth, and when he put it out there, uh, dereliction of duty and errors in judgment, everybody believed it. Everybody believed it. But many of the witnesses that were called, uh, all of the witnesses that were called, were anti-Kimmel. They vetted five guys, they would interview one because the other four guys were for Kimmel. They didn't do anybody that was actually guilty for Kimmel. So, he put it out there, and he had his scapegoat. Okay, after that, shortly after that, we had started getting other commissions. We had the Connaughton Report. This kid was an uh, ensign. I shouldn't say he was a kid. He was a, a college professor. He was a researcher. They gave him clearance on every secret. He had open doors to everything. He went in and did a naval internal report that was scathing to everybody else except Kimmel and the Navy. Everybody, up and down the line. He had names, dates, and what they did, and how bad it was, and what, what they should have done, and what they didn't do, and what they said they did, and what they didn't do. That report got hit real quick. It didn't come out until 1981. Kimball got an inkling that that report was out there in 1956, but he couldn't see it. Nobody would show it to him. Not released until 1981. Deadly, deadly against everybody except Kimball. The Army did the same thing. They had a McCormick report for the Army. They found Nash Kimball information had not been properly distributed. All that secret stuff on the magic machine. They couldn't show that to anybody because they had the word magic in it, so it was top secret. That one got hit away for many, many years. Now, 
once again, it proved everybody was guilty but Kimmel and Short. The Hardin Quarry cleared Kimmel, cleared Short. Then there was an Army Pearl Harbor board and it was on July 20, 1944, by the Act of Congress. They found, with what they had, that Kimmel and Short were not guilty. They found General Marshall and General Leonard Giroux, he was the director of the military intelligence at the time, they had not given uh, Kimmel the information he required from the, from the uh, dispatchers. They got a slap on the hand, just a, a reprimand, slap on the hand. And of course, Kimmel and Short had their lives ruined and all they got was just a little tap. Now, it might sound like I don't like General Marshall. Folks, General Marshall's a hero. He did so many great things during the war that without him, if he had been kicked out or found guilty of this, we would not have the Marshall Plan, we would not have had the, the fantastic logistics programs we had for World War II. He did all of that. He was known as the, the master supplier for World War II. And of course, the uh, Marshall Plan made it possible for cities in Europe to rebuild. He got money out to help people do it. Made the peace, the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. The Clausen investigation. No mention of dereliction or errors in that anywhere. And of course they, they named the other people. Not Kimmel, not Short. The Hewitt Inquirer. No mention of guilt for Kimmel. The Clark investigation. Now this is a good one. The Clark investigation found no fault with Kimmel and Short. They found fault with Stark and Turner. They, they literally came out and said, these two are not guilty. The guilty one is Stark. Just that, just put it right in black and white. The guilty party in this whole thing is Stark. And uh, the reason it's, it's so important is because just before this thing happened, Kimmel was in, he was able to get some information into that report that was uh, handy for the next trial. This gentleman right here, his name was uh, Captain Lawrence Safford. <coughs> Safford. Uh, Safford was the man that broke the military code, the Japanese military code here. He's the one that broke it just in time for Midway. That's how we knew Midway was going to be attacked because of what he did. The man was brilliant, <coughs> just a captain, but it's brilliant. He was making an internal report several years after that, and he didn't like Kimmel. He said, the guy, we were sending him all these secret stuff, and Kimmel wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. So he's making this report, and he's going over and says, okay, I want to get this one out of the file, and he goes over, it's not in the file. Okay, uh, let's get this other one. It's not in the file either. It's not where it's supposed to be. So he goes over here and says, okay, this is the receiving file. Let's go to the sent file. And he finds those reports in the file that says sent, and he pulls them up, and they're not stamped. Sent. If it's sent, there's a date and time stamp on it saying sent. So the ones that were sent were marked sent. All of the incriminating ones were not sent. So therefore, they weren't in the receipt basket because they were never received. He found out this, started looking at it, and he said, I gotta be wrong. So he had another crew start from scratch and do the whole thing again. And they found the same thing he found. The documents had never been sent that they found Kimmel guilty of. And guilty for not calling. So he had another person, another group, go over it his work and the other party's work and they confirmed it. He got in his car, he drove to New York City, he goes to the office of Admiral Kimmel, knocks on the door, Kimmel's working as an engineer at that time, knocks on the door, walks in unannounced, sits down and says to Kimmel, didn't you get any messages at all from magic? Kimmel's response was, what's magic? He had no idea what magic was. He had no idea this was going on. This guy, with those words, could have been court-martialed 
put in prison, maybe with the top secret stuff that wasn't put there. Shot. You know, I don't know. But he put his life and his career in jeopardy the minute he sat down and opened his mouth to Kimmel. Kimmel brought listen for about an hour and couldn't believe what he was telling him. And he had some copies of some of them documents that Kimmel just couldn't believe. So he called Kimmel called his attorney. The attorneys came in and they make arrangements to protect him. They can't just come out and say the stuff because if they do, they have to say where they got them. They can't do that. So they sneakily get in and they work some way out where they can come in and they can see some of the documents. They actually get copies of them. He has given them the numbers of the documents that they need to find. The attorneys got in through some subpoenas or some, some kind of sneaky way they got in there and they got copies. Now, when that Clark investigation came up, they mentioned that there were secret documents available that would clear Kimmel. That's basically it. But they got it in the record that there were secret documents. So, when the Congress got together and had the real, his day in court, uh, Congressional Court of Inquiry, that information was in the record and they were able to say to the judges, we have this information that we will clear us, but the Secretary of uh, uh, Navy has it and he won't release it. The judges, Congress, Congressional Congress people, created an order to the Secretary of the uh, Navy that, uh, actually, yeah, Secretary of Navy, Forrestal was his name. Uh, Forrestal wouldn't do it, so they, they made an order. You will release these papers. He still wouldn't release the papers. So he was sitting here in court trying to get those papers up. Real quick, we'll see some of the testimony. Uh, George Marshall sat down. They asked him all kinds of questions. Marshall was an expert at walking around the question mm -hmm. and never answering it. And if it got to where they really tied him down, he would. I had hundreds of papers going across my desk, and I can't expect to be remembered. I can't be expected to remember every one of them. So he would get out of answering it that way. He didn't answer any questions. He walked around every one of them. This guy here got caught in so many lies, it was pathetic. And he, he just was spitting it out like crazy, and, and it was all proven. A lot of his stuff was just proven lies. That's that Turner again. Uh, here's Stark. Stark was also very good at walking around a question and not answering. But he did lie. I'll give you the first lie that they that, uh, that I read about was uh, he would he had a direct line with Roosevelt, direct phone line. One of the few people that had that direct phone line. Roosevelt would call him at all hours of the day and night and start asking him to do things. And Roosevelt talked fast. Now, his nickname is Betty. Now, Betty, I want you to do this, and I want you to do this, and you finish today, I want you to do this, and then go over and do that. Anyway, and they're talking fast, and they could not take it down. So his aide started recording. They didn't have recorders like we have today. They didn't have digital, they didn't have tape, they didn't have records. But they had those cylinders. You've seen those the solar things with the cylinders on them, the plate, very delicate things. They had one of those and they started recording Robert uh, uh, Roosevelt's conversation so they could figure out what he was talking about. And when it was all over, he had talked to his aide, he said, did you get all that? He said, yeah, I got it. Well, start on it first thing tomorrow morning. You know. One of the first questions they asked him when he sat down to be examined was, did you ever record anything on Roosevelt? No, just that quick, no, never. Of course, his aide came in and told the whole story later on. But uh, he lied through his teeth, and he walked around. Now, Marshall, in his old, really old age, he was out of, he retired, and was just, Marshall came clean. He said he felt so guilty about what happened to Kimmel. He came clean with what he was doing and explained why he couldn't answer the question because it was almost all top secret, and he couldn't bring it out in the public. And he apologized, and he let everybody know that yes, Kimmel was right, we were wrong, but we couldn't, we couldn't help it. So uh, 
Dr. Van Hitchen. Dr. Van Kimmel were friends for 40 years, and when Kimmel started getting an inclination that he was holding back, he knew, and Kimmel actually discovered it. He found out this guy knew stuff that would have cleared Kimmel and never went to Kimmel's aid, never helped him, never protected him, always was covering up for secrets, and never, Kimmel hated his guts. <laughs> when he died, they found a letter in Kimmel's desk drawer that uh, addressed to him. It was never, ma never mailed or advised by his attorney. And basically, it was a short letter saying, I hope God forgives you because I never will for the amount of men that you caused to die. And it was a very hateful letter. Never mailed. Okay. Where are we now? Okay. They were trying to get those papers, those documents, and they couldn't get them. So they worked out a scheme. Now this is Richardson. This is the guy he replaced when he went to Pearl Harbor. He was the commander in chief at the time. They were talking, and in the lobby, in a loud voice, he was coached. In a loud voice, we want you to say something like this. Okay, uh, Barstow, Secretary of Navy's got papers in there that will clear me. They're secret papers. The court has ordered him to give them to us and put them on the table, and he's refusing. Without those papers, I can't prove that I'm not guilty. So I might as well just forget about the whole thing and just go to the press. Just forget about this whole thing and just go to the press and forget about it. And the next day, those papers were on the court's desk and being read. The judge's mouth dropped open. One guy's reading and he's got a pen. He gets so upset with what he's reading, he throws his pen down and bounces out into the audience and nearly puts a guy's eye out. The other guy's running the, running the whole show. He's got his gavel. He starts banging that gavel and says, we have to, we have to adjourn. <coughs> we have to read this. This is terrible. And of course, the next day, they had made their decisions. Kill a court and says, now you know. Now you see. And he was a happy camper. I love this picture. This guy here is kind of dumbfounded about the whole thing. These guys <laughs> back here are, are saying, did you, can you speak what's just going on? These guys over here said, did you hear what he said back, back there? These guys discussing the whole thing. This is his son, Edward, or Ned. This guy here's got one of those grins on his face that I can't really describe because it's a dirty word. <laughs> but he's got one of them grins. And the guy next to him is his attorney who's saying, I can't believe we've won this thing. Mm -hmm. So he, this is where he has won. He's been totally vindicated. And from that, he has no longer a scapegoat. Yay. And he's about to, it's still working. I mean, I, I read an article that was written in February this year, and they were still using words like, Kimmel supposedly did this, he supposedly did that. No, he didn't, he did do this. But it's getting wiped out, and it's still trying to get his rank and look at it. That's it, folks. Weren't there death threats against his family? Uh, yeah, as soon as this mm -hmm. happened, uh, he was getting death threats like crazy from people like judges, big time, high level people were sending him letters saying, uh, You shouldn't be drawing a salary. Uh, for what you did. You should take your last check and buy a gun and shoot yourself. Things would be slid under his door. His wife was getting death threats. His kids were in Annapolis and they didn't have too much trouble. Once or twice they did. But most of the people at Annapolis were aware of what was going on and they were smart enough to know that this was not, what you're seeing in the papers was what, not what was happening. So yes, he got lots of death threats. Got two right off the bat from judges, one in St. Louis and one in San Francisco. So that tells you that how badly he was treated by the press and by uh, Roosevelt and the powers that be. Uh, two things. One, what was that date again when he was cleared? Uh, he was cleared, uh, oh, geez, uh, 1944. Or, uh, I, don't, I don't remember. I'll have to check. And uh, is there any active movement to have his rank restored and reporting up? Yes. No, no. There, 
Five presidents have refused to do it, and they don't know why. Tom Kimmel, the great grandson, was in town, did a speech a few years ago when we put the statue up, and one of the things he said was that when they went to talk to the president, there was always another guy standing over on the side, and the guy would have a piece of paper in his hand and a piece of paper in this hand, and basically what he would do is the president said yes, he would get this piece of paper. If the president said, no, I'm not going to do it, he would get this piece of paper. One was to cover him for not doing it, and one was to tell him you better not. Was that because uh, even darker secrets was don't know about or what? That's my thought, but that's just my opinion. I think there's still something that, I, I, there's, there's all these years, people have been trying to put a conspiracy theory out there, a, a conspiracy, and they never have been able to. But I still think that that, that doesn't change a cover-up. There's a big time cover-up and I think Roosevelt is still being protected by our, our governors today. The one that asked for that first congressional meeting was, uh, I think it was Clinton. I'm pretty sure it was Clinton. And he, when it, when it came out and Kimmel was vindicated, and Congress wrote a proclamation telling the president that he needed to uh, give the right back, uh, Clinton was leaving office and didn't have time to do it. So they went to, who was next, Bush? And Bush wrote down, he said, no, I'm not gonna do it, and this is why. And it was kind of a lame thing, but he didn't do it. And so all of the presidents, five presidents have been asked. Now Biden, Biden was on the committee to make that first congressional meeting. He's the one that suggested it. So we don't know what Biden's gonna do. We'll see. Five presidents said no, we're not gonna give him the rank back. So something's something's in there. There's gotta be something holding it back. Some of the speculation that you said earlier about Congress, of course they were isolationists back in that time period. The people were when when war broke out. And I wonder if some of that information was held from General Short and General or Admiral Kimmel simply because Roosevelt wanted to get into the war, because I knew, he, I know for a fact that he did. He, he was, he was pro-Europe, yep. and that's why we put Europe first instead of Japan being yep. first. Yep. And so I just wondered if that was some of the reasoning for those gentlemen not being able to get the information they needed to protect the islands. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Yes. They can't prove it. No, there's no way we can prove it. And it might be still the reason why we can't get him his rank back, because they can't come out and say Roosevelt did it on purpose. So, yeah, I, I kind of lean with you. I think that he was holding back. I think that, I think, now this is just my personal opinion, folks, now, and, and I cannot prove it, but I think Roosevelt held back and other people were involved in it, and Marshall and some of the other, and maybe Churchill had his little fingers in there, but I think he held back I just don't think he realized how strong the attack would be. I think he just thought it was going to be a small attack. There were documents out there, letters being written, that said we have to find some way to make the Japanese fire first. And those letters are out there and you can read them. And uh, they're in publishing books and such as that. But there are letters out there saying uh, we, have to, we have to find a way to make Japan fire first so we can get this thing going. So you're right. I think that there was something going on that was, uh, you're right in my eyes. <laughs> Nobody's ever been able to prove it. So. And then there could be another little conspiracy aspect to this also, because you had MacArthur in the Philippines and he had all the time in the world to prepare for the, the attack because they knew it was gonna happen. <clears throat> And he had planes there, which we didn't have very many at that time, but they were wing to wing on the airstrip when, when the Philippines, Manila, was actually bombed. So I wonder, too, was there a little protection for MacArthur? I mean, I, that's just, that's me thinking. Yeah, I had about 30, 40 minutes on MacArthur in this thing I had to take out for time. <laughs> but I agree with you. I think uh, MacArthur was, uh, he had radar that worked. Yeah. He had a magic machine. You should do the mag magic machine. Ten people were allowed to see that, but I've taken them all. It comes down to actually hundreds of people saw it. We gave one to Britain, 
in Britain, all the people in Britain could read it. We gave one to the army, well, we gave two to Britain, one to the army. The army could read it. We sent one up to Alaska, to some base up in Alaska. Those guys could all read it. There were five or six of these machines floating around that other people had that could read it instead of those 10 people. And, and you start getting into the, the 10 that could do it. They had aides, they had assistants and everything, and all those people could read it. MacArthur had one, and he didn't read it. MacArthur had radar and had nine hours warning that the planes were coming in. Eisenhower actually wrote down that he did not see how MacArthur could lose all of his planes with that kind of a warning. And uh, MacArthur's getting all the good press, and uh, he was, actually he was, you read the newspapers, and I just spent a, a day or so at the, up here at the investigating newspaper articles, and I started stumbling across these articles about what MacArthur was doing. Oh, yeah, he's just pushed the Japanese back here. He's pushed the Japanese back here. He's doing this. He's brought his wife over, so it must be safe. You know, and, and all this good stuff that MacArthur's doing. And the truth of the matter was, in just, what, 30 days, they had they removed him from the place along with his family, and he let 24,000 men to be captured, starved and captured by the Japanese. And he had all the, all the things. He had the magic, he had the planes, he had Navy, he had everything, uh, and didn't do anything with it, nothing. He did go out one time and stand out there with some bullets were flying around for publicity. And, uh, but he was gone, and 24,000 guys, were, the majority of those guys were Filipino, but there was about 5,000 Americans, and uh, tons of them died on the march, the Bataan thing. So, uh, no, I, I'm not a, I don't, I, I didn't bring him up because I don't really care for him too much. I, I never really liked to talk to anybody that postures like that. Uh, you, you know, you've seen that picture where he's wading in? There's two of them. There's one where he's wading in and he's looking angry. Well, he is angry because he had tried to come in in a bigger, better boat, a, a, a landing craft, a big one. And the beach guy, just a sergeant, said no. We don't have room for that. You can't come in on that. So he had to turn around, go back out to the ship, and get a smaller one to come in. And when he came off of that thing, they took the picture. He was staring right at that sergeant, and he was ticked because that guy had made him come in. You sure it was a sergeant? I thought it was a, 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 a uh, Navy CB captain. Might, might have been. Or not a captain, but a lieutenant. Might have been. I, I, but, yeah, that was I heard months that and months ago. So. And, he, and the, the other one supposedly he walked in three or four times before he got the picture he wanted. So, uh, anybody that sits there and poses like this all the time. And the only thing I thought that he ever did that was really good was uh, I think he treated the Emperor of Japan exceptionally well. And uh, as far as the Korea thing, I don't think that was anything anybody would have done. I mean, anybody else would have done the same thing. You got an island shaped like an H, and you got all the Indians <coughs> down here. And you're fighting them against him. You go through the narrow part and you trap them and you catch them. So, now, what he didn't know was there's six hundred thousand ja uh, Chinese coming down from the north. Didn't plan on the Chinese coming in, but uh, tactically that was a good plan. But it was not a plan that was unique. Anybody would have done it. So I don't, I don't have much respect for MacArthur. And I hope people don't hate me for it. But okay, guys, it's getting late. Oh yeah. I have uh, eight or ten, maybe maybe twelve, uh, eight or ten pictures black and white of a portrait made by a photographer, a woman photographer, whose husband had a portrait, you know, island a kind of back. That's all they've seen. Some of the pictures I've seen before in other magazines and pictures, but some of them I haven't seen. They're all really interesting pictures. Well, you know what? Bring them I up. I need to bring them tonight. I've got all the time. Bring them up and let her scan them and tell us as much as you can. We'll put those into our records. We have to see that. That needs to go into a file. So Donna sits up there, and she's not there. Glenn will be there. And so somebody will be more than happy to scan that into our files and with this stuff. We'd love to have it. It's written on mine. Oh, get your backup behind you. Mm -hmm.